This episode of Blood Splattered Cinema is dedicated to Zachary of Zachary at Large fame. He may have been put to rest this last October, but he will forever live on in the hearts of many a horror fan. Rest in peace, Zachary. You will be missed, but you will never be forgotten. I need my fix. Gotta get my fix or I'm gonna turn tricks. Perfect. Thanks, Hobo Steve. <laughs> Wait, didn't I kill you a few episodes ago? <laughs> but Guru, <laughs> I am dead. <laughs> well, I guess what they say is true. Sometimes, dead is better. But brain damage is the best! Brain damage, now you're really out of your mind. Honestly, that's totally a good thing, because I wouldn't want to be in there too long. It's scary in there. <laughs> Nightmare fuel aside, brain damage is a hilarious product of 1980s anti-drug hysteria. It's a gloriously exploitative take on the same worldview that brought us Dare, Just Say No, and eventually... Drugs are bad, okay? But the major difference between that bullshit and this movie is... This movie's actually fucking fun! And it just so happens to be my favorite film by director Frank Henenlotter. Really? Brain damage? What about Basket Case or Frankenhooker? All great movies, yet for some reason I still found myself renting brain damage way more as a kid. Though, when I ask myself why, I can't think of a good reason outside of its cover art. Like seriously, the fuck am I even looking at here? You got a spaced out Johnny Depp with Jubilee's powers bursting from his head, while the bastard child of Mr. Hanky and a Chuck Jones painting lurks over his shoulder. How could I not watch this? It's practically daring me. No, not that kind of dare. This kind. And trust me when I say, the movie itself is even crazier than the cover art. So without further ado, let's get Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds for this week's parasitic head trip is none other than Frank Henenlotter's Brain Damage. And right away, it looks like the title sequence is experiencing the quickening. That'll give you some real brain damage, I'll tell you that. Anyway, following the most electrifying titles in sports entertainment, we're immediately introduced to the Ackermans, who seem a little too excited over a bag of calf brains. Oh, these are beautiful. Oh, he loves them. Unless the he is Bub from Day of the Dead, then I highly doubt that. Unfortunately, the he in question seems to have gone missing. Either that or Mrs. Ackerman is suffering from a severe case of aquaphobia. Which I can't really blame her, I mean, Barbie Girl is fucking terrifying. <laughs> uh, ah! Oh man, what a couple of basket cases. Following that absolutely dreadful adaptation of Midway's Rampage, we finally meet our real protagonist, Brian whatever the fuck his last name is. Wait, his name is called Brian, and the movie's called Brain Damage? I'm not sure if that's clever wordplay or the dumbest thing I've heard all day. It turns out, though, Brian's not feeling too well, and despite his girlfriend's pleas, cannot attend the concert that they had planned to see. So she instead goes with his brother, otherwise known as the half-assed bear Jew cosplayer, holy shit. And once those two leave, that's when things get really weird. Jeez, I've heard of being wall-eyed, but this is ridiculous. Yikes, that is a lot of Windex. Though I suppose it's more like Lou's Dex at this point? But on the bright side, at least his room will have a streak-free shine. I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you are, but I know you're in here. I know who they are, and uh, they're called the Camera Crew. Much to Brian's horror, he discovers a parasitic organism named Aylmer has taken residence on his body. Which sounds pretty bad at first, but isn't as bad when you realize that he's voiced by none other than Zachary of Zachary at Large fame. Though after seeing this movie, I think I finally understand what the large in that title was referring to. Cause that's a penis. 
I'll show you the light if you'll take me for a walk. A walk? Where? Anywhere you like. I'm uh, hungry. I feel like this is the same deal I make with my dog every morning, except in her case, there is no light, just shit. Brian accepts the Faustian bargain, jacks into the penal matrix, and takes Aylmer on the previously agreed upon walk. This leads him to a junkyard where he briefly encounters Herbie the Drug Bug before hallucinating his very own Daft Punk concert. Though in truth, the only thing Daft in this situation is our protagonist himself. Jesus, young Barack Obama takes his security job very seriously. Ain't nobody getting those launch codes on my watch. Oh shit, he's got the trump card. Oh, so that's what happened to the car from Maniac. It turned into the credits from Frankenhooker. Anyway, the security guard apprehends Brian, only to discover the, um, hard way that Aylmer, he kind of feeds on brains. <laughs> I guess rent-a-cops really are dickheads. I honestly can't tell anymore if he's trying to remove Aylmer or jerk him off. Even more confusing is whether this is a black or blue lives matter situation. Oh, Guru, that joke was in bad taste. Excuse you, sir. That was not in bad taste. He was clearly in dead alive. Oh, guess it is. Following that brutal unhappy ending, we flash forward a few weeks where, despite his girlfriend's protests, Brian insists that life has never been better. I can look into a mirror and see a thousand different faces staring back at me. I can turn night into day or, or, or watch the darkness shine and I don't even have to open my eyes. Oh great, he's now that guy in college who drops acid for the first time and now thinks he's a fucking wizard. Where I come from, we call that the Grant Morrison. I'd question whether this is more an anti-drug or pro-veganism message, but I'm honestly more curious as to why the brains have asthma. I take that back. One of them has asthma while the other's getting head. Brian completely abandons his girlfriend, because of course he does, and then takes another hit of the Aylmer juice. Luckily for him, however, there's a punk club right next door, the perfect place to trip the fuck out. But wait a minute, the club is just called Hell? Isn't that a little... This. It's a little this. Holy shit! This club really is off the hook. Brian catches the eye of a bodacious babe who lures him out back for some, uh, special alone time. Oh my my my, what's going down out here? Or should I say, who's going down out here? Yikes, that's a whole lot of fellatia, no. Funny enough, they shot this scene without any permits, yet that wasn't what caused some of the crew members to quit on set on this very day. It was actually the scene's really graphic content, though why none of them actually read the script beforehand is beyond me, but, oh, well, their loss, I guess. But the truly frustrating thing is that neither the MPAA nor the original distributor allowed this scene to remain in the R-rated cut, even though that cut was already intended for adults because it was the are rated cuts because censorship is the best or the dumbest brian stumbles into an alley where it's either his time of the month or he's finally caught on to aylmer's murderous intentions he's eventually confronted by mr ackerman in a scene intended to evoke the maltese falcon of all things which is kind of like if killer condom decided to homage casablanca or something it's just weird man Aylmer, an old English word meaning the all-inspiring famous one. Actually, Aylmer means infamous, which is a little different than awe-inspiring. In fact, it would be more accurate to say Aylmer the ire-inspiring famous one. Mr. Ackerman breaks down Aylmer's long history of hosts, which include a shit ton of royalty, which is a legitimately cool backstory, yet it doesn't stop this scene from being really fucking boring. It's like the worst parts of history class, except entirely made up. I guess what I'm trying to say is this scene could use a whole lot more show and a hell of a lot less tell. Run! Run! Brian heads home where he accidentally wakes up his brother, who apparently sleeps with a key around his neck for no reason whatsoever. That's the key to my heart, bro. 
Brian then realizes he needs to regain control of his life, so he rents out a shady hotel room and tries to go cold turkey. I don't remember where I went or who I met or what I did. All I remember is feeling something sticky in my pants and then finding them covered in blood. Dude, it's called your period, though I guess since you're a guy, it's more of an exclamation point. Aylmer challenges Brian to see who will crack first if they both hold out. Unfortunately, it's a little easier for Aylmer to hold off on brains than it is for Brian to completely detox. Gee, I wonder who could have guessed that would happen. Certainly not me. <laughs> Remember, kids, don't do drugs or you'll do magic tricks with your insides. Though I guess that would make you a real wizard of gore, wouldn't it? The nightmares prove too much for Brian, who finally caves in and searches for another victim. It's a little ironic, though, how a guy with a hundred locks on his door doesn't even know how to pick one. <laughs> Fun fact, though, this dude walking in the hallway here was also the crack-smoking rabbi from Frankenhooker. Pretty cool. See, that's true equality. It's not about removing all the tits. It's about also putting man meat on display for those who like beefcake. Your mom likes beefcake. Well, this shot looks like shit. For reasons not explained, though, Aylmer completely bypasses Zorro from Frankenhooker and instead goes for a young Bruno Mars. I love how that's clearly just a guy in the stall squirting a water bottle up at the ceiling. It's these kind of do-it-yourself effects that make movies like this so fucking endearing. By the way, the guy squirting the blood in the stall here is none other than Henenlotter himself, because of course it is. But to get back to the movie, Brian returns home and discovers his girlfriend has fallen into the arms of his annoying-as-shit brother. I guess that means the tea on his jacket earlier must have stood for traitor this whole time. This scene is actually really tragic because at this point Brian has given up all hope and is now stuck listening to his brother fuck his ex-lover in the adjacent room. It's a brutal twisting of the knife, but it's one that gets me every time. I also like how throughout the whole movie, Henenlotter has used the color blue to signify Aylmer's influence. Because not only is his juice itself blue, almost all the scenes involving him are tinted blue. It's a simple motif, but it works on multiple levels. To get back to the movie, however, Brian accepts Aylmer's comfort once again and slips off into space, the full frontal frontier. Ah, yes, talk about dreams of the bitch house. Jeez, even his dreams think he's an asshole. To be fair, though, at least he wants her for more than her body. Anyway, after waking up from the completely ludicrous fuck mirror, Brian warns both his betrayers that they need to stay the hell away. His ex-girlfriend refuses, though, and follows him out because, it turns out, Death Wish was way more than just a movie from the 70s. It was also a book. Keep you talking about getting killed or killing someone or <laughs> Okay, not only is that a terrible effect, it's also inconsistent with the way Aylmer has been presented up to this point. So far, Aylmer has been presented as leech-like, as in he sticks to the body of his hosts. But now all of a sudden, he's coming out from the inside. And I just feel like this possibility could have been established way earlier, is all I'm saying. That being said, what happens next is just plain awesome. That's right, Dwayne from Basket Case just officially established a Henenlotter cinematic universe. Man. I can't wait to see their civil war. Unfortunately, the amazing crossover is short-lived as Dwayne realizes that something is not right with Brian. Which, I mean, he's not wrong. I mean, the very next thing Brian does is murder his ex-girlfriend and eat her brains. Because as it turns out, sometimes dreams do come true. <laughs> So, apparently killing your ex-girlfriend not only gives you predator vision out of fucking nowhere, it also fills your mouth up with monster spaghetti. Complete side note, but this is kinda crazy. You see, the headline on this newspaper here was not created for the shoot, it just so happened to be the headline of that day's newspaper. Pretty fucking wild. And speaking of wild, it looks like Brian's looking for the wrong kind of Oscar. 
We want him back. We want him back now. I'm honestly not even sure why they think Elmer would want to go back with them. I mean, they fed him calf brains while Brian fed him human. You'd think his preference would be a no-brainer. So Aylmer then exposes the Ackermans for the shit for brains they truly are. And you just gotta love Mr. Ackerman slowly pulling Aylmer closer to him as if it has any leverage whatsoever. <laughs> totally buying it. Though not as much as I'm buying Mr. Ackerman's so-called death here. Holy shit. <laughs> Where I'm from, we call that move the medulla oblongata. Ackerman squeezes Ilmer to death, injecting way too much juice into Brian's brain. And geez, I almost feel bad for the little guy here. I mean, as bad as one can feel for a life-ruining parasite anyway. Ackerman falls dead for really reals this time, but unfortunately for Brian, the excess juice has caused a fleshy snowman to grow from his forehead. Do you want a brain tumor? Brian barricades himself in his room and prepares to commit suicide. The cops then arrive for no reason whatsoever, and with the help of Brian's brother, break down his door. And it's at this point the movie goes completely off the rails. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. So that was Brain Damage, not only my favorite Frank Henenlotter film, but also the only film that has ever made me want to drop acid. Well, except for 12 Years a Slave, of course. We're monsters! I mean, sure, on the surface, this is an after-school special of a horror film, if I've ever seen one, and as such, it's dated in many ways. Yet, I still enjoy it, because it's trippy as all fuck. There are a few moments that drag, though, with a few scenes that run way too long, so I wouldn't be surprised if anyone watches this with the fast-forward button on standby. But despite all that, it's impossible to get bored with Aylmer himself. He's a special effects showcase, and Zach Zachary fills him with so much charm, you might find yourself wanting a taste of his juice all for yourself. So if you like your psychedelic frightmares with a charming dose of cheese, then toke up with brain damage and have yourself a good time. And, uh, I guess with that out of the way, it's time I give my good buddy Hobo Steve a, uh, proper burial. Peace out, my fellow gorehounds. That's where that shit goes.